Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. In America, Thanksgiving is considered a holiday where families get together. They bond and share what they are thankful for. Sometimes Thanksgiving and or Christmas are the only holidays some families get to travel and see each other. Families enjoy good food, share laughs, and appreciate the quality time spent together. But one thing that is hard to avoid during these times is family drama. Secrets, jealousy, and lies can bring about the worst attitudes and ones who were excited are now wishing they were back home and away from their family. So much was true for the Andrews family. Sweet and mild-mannered Lowell killed his loving family on what was supposed to be a happy Thanksgiving weekend. William and Opal Andrews lived on a farm in Wolcock, Kansas and had two children together, Jenny Marie and Lowell Lee. Lowell was born on September 21, 1940. To neighbors and extended family members, the Andrews were a loving family and many people had great things to say about Lowell. He was polite, kind, smart, always listened and had great manners. One neighbor was quoted saying that he was the nicest boy in Wolcott. Standing at six feet, one inch, and 250 pounds, his size meant nothing and his quiet demeanor allowed him to fade in the background. He did not like much attention and spent most of his time reading, learning science, and listening to music. The only worry his parents ever had was how often he spent time alone or how often he spent hours in his room reading. Opal, although worried, chucked it up as her son just being shy because of his weight and size. His family were devout Baptists and his parents were financially successful running their farm. Lowell did well in school and upon graduation, he was accepted to Kansas University in Lawrence, which was just an hour away from his family home. His love for science and music continued on with him in college because he majored in zoology and played the bassoon for the college's orchestra. Lowell had a good first year and was now in his sophomore year at Kansas University. It was nearing Thanksgiving and like most schools, Lowell's school had a break. During Thanksgiving break 1958, Lawrence and Jenny left their colleges to visit and spend time with their parents. Thanksgiving went on without any issues, but a few days after Thanksgiving, Lowell was feeling indifferent. Jenny and Lowell's parents were in the living room watching television, but like typical Lowell, he was secluded in his room reading The Brothers Karamzov. The Brothers Karamzov is the last novel written by author Fyodor Dostoevsky that took two years to write. The book is very deep and it takes a look into questions of God, ethics, and free will. In the book, faith is brought up along with the critical thinking concept of doubt and reason. The main plot of the book revolved around patricide, so the conclusion could be made that this book motivated Lowell to gather up enough strength to do something unfathomable. Lowell finished the whole book the night of November 28, 1958, and immediately went into the bathroom to shave. After cleaning up, he equipped himself with a rifle and a pistol that was stashed away in the upstairs closet and proceeded to walk downstairs to where his family was watching television. After making it downstairs, Lowell fatally shot Jenny first, Opal second, and then William. After killing everyone, he opened a window and then began to ransack the house to make it look like a robbery gone bad. When he was finished staging a fake scene, Lowell grabbed the two guns and headed off to his university. It was snowing and very cold that night, but Lowell ended up making a stop when he made it to a bridge in order to ditch the guns by throwing them in the Kansas River. He continued on with his drive and made it to his dorm at the university. The landlord questioned why he was back, being that all of the students were off campus for the holidays. He communicated with her that he was only there to pick up his typewriter in order to complete a homework assignment. After gathering his typewriter, he left to enjoy a showing of Mardi Gras at the Granada Theater in Lawrence, Kansas. The typically shy and quiet Lowell was a very different person that night. He was very talkative with people at the theater, including an usher and the candy bar attendant. The late showing ended at around 11 o'clock that night, and once over, Lowell drove back to his family home in Wolcott, and the first thing he did was feed his dog. He then called the cops to report a robbery and waited on the front porch with his dog until cops arrived. Police arrived at around 1 o'clock the following morning, and Deputy Myers, who was a responding officer, was quoted saying, 
This big, dark-haired boy, Lowell Lee, he was sitting on the porch petting his dog. Lieutenant Athey asked the boy what happened and he pointed to the door real casual and said, look in there. After officers discovered the dead bodies, they called for backup and began questioning Lowell. Lowell denied knowing anything and expressed his innocence as well. They told him that his clothes would be tested for gun residue and he responded by saying he shot his gun the previous afternoon in an attempt to kill a hawk that was flying near their home. Responding officers questioned Lowell for about 10 minutes and although they noted he cried once, overall he seemed very unconcerned or bothered that his family was killed. The assistant county attorney arrived at the scene of the crime and Lowell was asked what he was going to do about the funeral arrangements to which he replied, I don't care what you do with them. After detectives found out the Andrews family belonged to a Baptist church nearby, they reached out to the pastor of the church, Reverend V.C. Damerin, so that he could speak with Lowell. It was now around 2.30 in the morning and Lowell was taken into temporary custody. He was driven to a courthouse in Kansas City, but there was no discussion of pressing charges on him because they were not 100% sure he had anything to do with the murders yet. Shortly after his arrival, Reverend Damerin made it and requested to interview Lowell in private. The assistant county attorney was quoted saying, Yes, of course. He is not accused of anything, and we certainly don't know whether he has anything to do with this or not, but talk to him and any information he can tell us relative to this would certainly be helpful. Reverend Damon's request was granted. They spoke about Thanksgiving and the days following it. Reverend Damon said, You didn't do this terrible thing, did you? If you did, now was the time to purge your soul. After hearing this, Lowell admitted to the crimes against his family. After hearing Lowell's confession, Reverend Damon advised Lowell that he did not have to speak with investigators and that he would refer him to good lawyers that could help him. He made a point to let Lowell know that not only was he his minister, but his friend as well, and he would stay with him for as long as he needed to make sure his rights were preserved. With that information, Reverend Damon walked out of the interview room into the waiting room and told the assistant county attorney along with officers that Lowell was ready to give a statement. Lowell was advised by the attorney as well that he did not have to make a statement, but Lowell gave him the same reply that he gave the reverend. The attorney then called for a stenographer who arrived in 20 minutes. While waiting for the stenographer to arrive, Lowell was given a can of Coke and then made a voluntary statement in front of everyone in the waiting room. He was asked how he felt during the murders and he replied by saying, I didn't feel anything about it. The time came and I was doing what I had to do. That's all there was to it. His confession of killing three people was transcribed, signed by Lowell, and then taken to the Justice of Peace at around 4 o'clock in the morning. Within the next few days, Lowell led police to the Kansas River where he ditched the guns. Detectives were only able to find pieces of the guns. He was also taken to a clinic in Topeka, Kansas, where he spoke with Dr. Joseph Satin. Dr. Satin diagnosed Lowell with schizophrenia, but said that he was not delusional, knew right from wrong, and was aware of everything. Lowell also admitted for the first time that the reason he killed his family was to inherit the family farm and to get the $1,800 savings that were in his father's bank account. Dr. Satin called it the sudden murders because Lowell was sane before and after the crimes. He could see that Lowell was clearly emotionally detached from the murders, but deserved to be punished for his crimes. During trial, Lowell pled not guilty by reason of insanity, and his voluntary confession was also presented. When the jury was not present, the reverend was questioned. What were the circumstances under which the defendant confessed to you in the first place, reverend, when you went into the room? I went in there, I advised him I was there not only as his minister but as his friend, and we first talked about Thanksgiving, his vacation and school, and a few remarks like that, and then I expressed my regrets as to what had happened out there, and I sympathized with him and told him that I knew he was deeply concerned about what had happened and that he was just as anxious as I and others to find who were the guilty parties. And I said, knowing you all of your life, Lee, and your parents, I cannot believe that you had any part in this crime, but there is some question in the minds of the officers as to the fact that maybe you did have something to do with it, and I am sure that you wouldn't object to taking a lie detector test in order to establish your innocence so that the officers can get busy and find the guilty party. And I said, Lee, you didn't do this, did you? And then it was that he said he did. Is that all he said? Well, I asked him why, and he told me the story. 
Did you feel that he was confessing to you as his minister and because of his relation to you or because of the discipline of the church? There is no such discipline in the Baptist church that a member confesses to the minister his crime or wrongdoing. He was seemingly purging his soul of what he had done and was talking to me not only as a minister but as a friend, almost a member of the family, in fact. Lee was in complete charge of his faculties. He knew what he had done and why. Lowell, on the other hand, made it seem like the Reverend was a police interrogator and pretended to be his friend and a man of God the night he confessed. The court ruled that Reverend Dameron was not in violation of his professional Christian role and was there as a friend and not there to coerce Lowell. Lowell's insanity defense failed and he was found guilty and sentenced to death. He was sent to Kansas death row at Lansing Prison alongside Richard Hickok and Perry Smith. Richard was quoted saying, I really liked Andy. He was a nut. Not a real nut like they keep hollering, but you know, just goofy. He was always talking about breaking out of here and making his living as a hired gun. He liked to imagine himself roaming around Chicago or Los Angeles with a machine gun and a violin case cooling guys. Said he'd charge a thousand bucks per stiff. Lowell did try to appeal his case and requested a new trial, but his request was denied. While on death row, some sources say that Lowell dropped from 260 plus pounds all the way down to 180 pounds before his scheduled execution. He had a last meal of fried chicken on November 29, 1962, which was the night before his execution. Lowell was able to speak with reporters and was quoted saying, I'm not sorry and I'm glad I did it. I just don't know why I did it. He never showed remorse, but days leading up to his death, people around him continued to relay that he was a nice and sweet young man. Lowell was officially pronounced dead after being hanged at 12.01 a.m. on November 30, 1962. After his death, he was buried next to his family at the Mount Salem Cemetery in Excello, Missouri. William, Opal, and Jenny's names are all labeled on one tombstone, while Lowell has a separate tombstone next to it with sun engraved on it. Thank you all for watching another episode of Death Row Executions. And now for discussion and question time. You are alive now. Think about if one of your family members kills you and your relatives. Would you want to be buried next to them? What about future generations coming to the grave to show respect and they have to be reminded of the murderer each visit? Let me know what you guys think in the comments below.